just first of all like to say about 1993, uh, Eileen referred to Eileen's talk earlier on, wasn't it wonderful? And just also to say, Eileen, do you know Eileen was the first time, first person ever to get homegrown money to, for a PA service, right? That was the first time the health board at the time uh, uh, bought home home services in that way. And of course, to Donald, you were riding high, Donald, that time. You were the journalist of the year, voted by your peers of 1993, I think. So uh, we had we had tremendous vision. We had great energy. We had super expectations. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I'm going around the same circle again today. Anyway, I just wanted to say that to you. I want to also say to you that I tend to ramble. So Ashling is here with me and every now and again, she's going to give me a clip in the ear and come back and so forth. My presentation, uh, I could really have done it well if I had recorded all the different ones I've done over the years and bothered to remember them. But you know, when you speak off the top of your head, you forget what you say anyway, and you try and make it interesting at the time. So you never up, end up with anything. I'm looking down there at John. John, the only figure in our life, believe me, I can't give you the exact one, but it's about 185 euro a week, right? That's all. And what we have to buy and what we pay for having that under 85, I might as well, I don't include myself right now in this, but I did at one time in the future, is truly amazing. The first thing is once you get that 185, you're excluded from any kind of dole, living allowance, any kind of an income, right? So I, or people with disabilities, we're not allowed to go for the dole, we're not allowed because they give us the disability, a DPMA, as they used to call it, personal maintenance allowance. But what we have to pay for that is related to our cost to disability very often. And so they use it abroad and they say, oh yes, we have a cost of disability, disability allowance. But then they don't remember to say, actually, that procures people from anything like that. Now, I, I'm just going to give you some little bit of experiences over the years myself. I'm in the workplace since 1970. I paid taxes more than my share right through. There was a decade in the middle that I was a little bit cleverer than most, but I had to be. And I didn't quite evade tax, I avoided. I'm not sure which is the right one. But my first job I, 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 I worked in, I had to pay full tax, full this, full that, and I couldn't, I couldn't get anything. But I was all right. I worked in a medical place, so anything I needed, I knew how to get it through the back door, right? So whether it was medical card, medicine, anything like that, I worked in the system, so I wasn't worried. I, I was at that for a long while. You won't believe what I was. I was. Uh, a recreational coach. I used to coach swimming. I would never put my foot in the water in my life, but I taught swimming for many years. Uh, I taught some of them to prepare them for the 1984 Olympics. I believe it or not. So anyway, that was it. I, I enjoyed reading there a little while back, about two months ago, where a guy in Manchester, he's the first guy with a disability and he's the team coach, right? So he's never kicked a football in his life because he's been disabled since he was born. So I says, God, yeah, I, I thought, I was, my biggest fear during swimming wasn't that I didn't know anything because I could make it up and you could always get the kids believe anything, or so I thought. But my biggest fear was that someday the habit was that you throw the coach into the into the pool. So that was the, my biggest worry at any given time. I worked at that for a few years. I went on working at it for a decade. But in about 74, I got this wonderful opportunity. I was only 20 years of age, and I'll tell you something. I was headhunted. 
imagine that. I can tell you that I was headhunted. I was headhunted by the Taxi, Taxi Association of Ireland, right? They wanted me to run their base for them. It was Ryan's cab at the time. They were the biggest. And I had the full works. Great, great way they interviewed that time. They brought me out to dinner and everything. And then they told me to pay. And then they, they, they it, oh, can I introduce you to a bit of the fiddle? Right. So that was very important as well. And the extras. So I had no worries. I had everything I wanted. This was a job that I could work 24 hours a day if I wanted to. And I was ambitious and I was going to organize everybody around me. And the whole works, we sat down, we, uh, we agreed. One of the deals was that I would have free, free travel at any time, the whole works. And then somebody at the very end put a clanger in it. Jesus boss, how's he going to get up the stairs? Right? I couldn't get up the stairs. I never knew that they, their base was up three floors at the time. So needless to say, I didn't get the job. But I got free taxis as compensation for about two years. Uh, and I got to know a lot of them. But anyway, I was really disappointed. I was very, very disappointed. I'd put a lot of time into it. But anyway, that, that's so my benefit was no use to me. I would have lost it anyway, even if I could get it. But the cost was, I was costed out in that way. I was costed out in so many other different ways as well. Not least of all, uh, not least of all, in my next job when I went into the 80s and I wanted to move into a different kind of work and I was working with business people and my job, my I had a beautiful job, was I'd sit with them. They were all a group of small businesses and they used to work together and I would go and spend time with them with their accountant and this, that and the other. I couldn't work. I couldn't earn a pay. Why? Because I put myself at risk of losing all the supports I had. So those businessmen came up cleverly and you know what they did for me? They hired two personal assistants officially and directly and they got me for free. So, and that was it, but that was, so that's part, that's part of the kind of life. Now, at the time I was wonderful. It was great, I didn't have anything. But sometimes I look back at it and say, why did I have to do that? Why did I have to operate outside the system? Why did I feel so excluded and forced out at every hand's turn? And that's what it was like. Just because everything got to do with me and people with disabilities cost so much more, right? For instance, food costs a little bit more for a lot of people and for me as well. Heat, I can't live without heat, right? Anybody who spends any kind of time with me will say, Jesus, how do you stick that heat? And I'd say, I can't be without it. And that's the reality. So from now until next May, I would be using the equivalent of probably three households of heat. And my household consists of uh, one and a half bedrooms. I want to tell you another little time feeling being left out, pushed out, etc. was I, I was at, uh, I wanted to buy a house, right? I couldn't get a mortgage. No way they couldn't risk it. First of all, I was single. I couldn't demonstrate a consistency of income, etc. And we had to fight that one, fought it, I didn't win. But I continued fighting. Then I did really well. I got on the housing list and I got myself a local authority place, right? And great. And I went back and I started working again. Then the big problem was I was earning too much money. So I had to hand them way more than anybody else was paying for rent at the time as an individual because I was earning money and I couldn't buy a place of my own. So therefore, I was taking it and giving it back. So I had to come up with another clever little reason at the time. So these are all little tips at different times, not saying that we should have to put up with it. I had to buy myself a pension fund so that I could reduce the amount of money that I was paying every month so that I could reduce, reduce when I, and again, I had to jump all these extraordinary hurdles, right? I wanted to buy some transport. Now, 
somebody on the kind of salary that I was at on and that I am today, a typical car for me would be around the 20,000. But I'm disabled, you see. And I have to get a, a van that's equivalent to that. And even though I get a grant and a VAT and a VRT rebate on my vehicle, my net costs will be somewhere in the order of 35 to 40,000, right? 35 to 40, and it's not even as comfortable as the car you would get for 20,000. So these are some of the little things. Uh, we were casted out in so many different ways as well when it came to, when it came to work, uh, or when it came to so many other different things. Now, I, uh, I just want to just say a couple of things. In the 90s, I got very much back into disability and I got very much back into, I had spent a little bit of time in America, I'd learned a bit about the independent living and I'd learned a number of different th things. And I learned that one thing I learned and that is if we want to change things, it's up to us. Nobody else is going to change it, right? It's up to us, people with disabilities. It's up to us, parents of people with disabilities, right? We are the people that have the living experience of disabilities, right? Nobody else. So we've got to, and how do we make change? We don't make change in the way we would imagine, in a sensible kind of way and in an intelligent way. I learned a very long time ago, politics is about one thing, it's about numbers, right? Nothing more, just numbers, right? Well, based on that, I would, I would ask people here today to do a number of different things. The 10th of October, that's another number, the 10th of October. Anybody know anything about the 10th of October, what it is? The by -elections. Huh? The by elections. There's two by elections in the country, right? Uh, we can decide to give existing governors, uh, government and other people, you know, a nice little reminder. We don't even have to live in the constituency. Now is the time to put the, and it's four days before the budget, right? And let them remind us, remind them that actually it's not about an economy recovering. It's about a people recovering. And that's what we have to say, right? All the way. And if, and it's about our human rights to be part of society and to end the segregation that we have to put up with now, once and for all. We have been hidden away for too long, and the cost of being hidden away, we're bearing it in every hand's turn. Now, really, people, we are the experts. Nobody else, right? If you have a disability, or if you have somebody with a disability in your family, we become the experts. Sometimes it's okay to take advice from the professionals. They're very important, but we must say and decide what's the best. If we don't do that, we will end up just like Eileen said, we will be passive dependent people in society. So now is the time. Get into the driving seat of your life do something about it and exercise your right to a job, to a fair income and to all of the other opportunities. It's like when we go upstairs today, I couldn't find a place to sit down. The beautiful places to sit down, but they were all up two, two steps. Now that's not, that's not Jim's problem, it's certainly not Paddy's problem, but it's the Hilton Hotel. Is it Paris who owns this one? I don't know which. You know, we can expect better. We should demand better of them. And we've got to demand more of our local authorities. Do you know in our counties, buses drive up and down every day. Do you hear that, twins? 
up and down every day and they're not even accessible. But yet, procurement allows this. GPs, you can't even get into their surgeries, yet they get public money. Taxis, taxis, I'm going to leave it to you now in a minute. Uh, Ashling, she's got a beautiful few sayings on taxis, but I'm going to steal this one. In 2000, when mainstreaming came in, there was 3% of taxis accessible. Today, after a big grant given out there about three months ago, we have reached the almighty figure of 4%. And guess what? 2% of them forget their ramps, and the other 2% only come out at <coughs> night, right? And that's, that's, that's part, that's the reality of it. So folks, let's twiddle or tweet or whatever we do right now. Let's get it out there. Let's Facebook ourselves. Let's get the messages out there that we are going to demand real change at these by-elections. Some, some interesting, Jesus, will you get everybody to do it? I don't do it at all. Uh, <clears throat> you're an embarrassment, brother. Uh, uh, the next, uh, the next, uh, we are one in eight, and we have friends. Let's borrow their vote, just for these by-elections. Can we write to all the people of the constituency of Dublin, South East or South West? Can we please? and ask them for our vote, for their vote, and to vote for who we want this time out. And let the, let the whole place tweet that, get it out there. You know, if you can get a photograph, book of advice, can we get a photograph of who you're gonna give your vote to? Come on, folks, all we need is a little bit of imagination. It's up to us. I, I, will, I can have you listening forever to people who design cars, and look under the bonnet and tell you the wonderful thing and make it even interesting. Sorry, John, I'm not picking on you uh, or anybody else for that matter. But the reality is all we need is the car to get us from A to B, right? Now, the car we need right now is the vote. So let's borrow some people's vote and get something going on it. Come on, creative Jonathan uh, and so forth. Let me look for, that's one thing I would call for today. Let's borrow their votes. The other thing I would call for today, and I hope you don't mind me talking so long, Paddy. The next thing, <laughs> uh, the next thing I would, I'm looking for an Eileen Daly. An Eileen Daly to be hired in every department with a lived experience, uh, to bring a living experience of disability. I'm looking for an Eileen Daly with that living experience to be hired in every county council, to be hired in every public support, not because she's disabled, not because she's part of a quota, but because of her knowledge, her expertise, and her huge understanding of living with a disability in society today. So, make a call for that. And, but it's up to us, we can call all we like, it's at the ballot box. That's where we can make a change. Um, Ashling, I told you I probably wouldn't need your help. <laughs> but uh, do you want to read out? I just wanted to read out some little things that I had written earlier on. Because do you want to go through it? Yes. I had put it down initially as an introduction. but So take it. <clears throat> For many years, many of us fought to be part of society, to be no longer segregated, i.e. special schools, special instructions, special transport, special food and special lives. In the year of 2000, 12th of June to be more precise, the government of this country finally listened. After three years of intense planning, breakdowns, breakaways and demolishing, they announced mainstreaming. For those of you here who didn't notice, it was known as the M Day. In practical terms, sorry. In practical terms. In practical terms, what did it mean? It meant closing down the National Rehabilitation Board, moving all responsibilities for employment into Enterprise and FOSS, information and advice into the then Quarla, now CIB, and the establishment of the NDA, the National Disability Authority, and as people from my community know it, the Nothing Doing Anyway organisation. 
This may be harsh, but perception can be reality. In real terms, what did it mean to me and the cohort of people I speak for? No more could we be turned away if we went to local citizens' information centres and be told that there was a special place for us known as the NRB. No more if I went into FOSS could I be escorted to the door. That's if I was lucky enough to find an accessible FOSS office and then to be told that this was not the place for me. No more could any public service plan without me and me included. You can imagine how I and so many more of us felt that day, how at last our dream had been realised. But not just that, but that our beliefs in having such a dream were, were vindicated. As many along the road have told us, we were crazy. It'll never happen, or couldn't happen. We would eventually be the big losers. And sometimes, even today, 14 years on, their voices sound in my head occasionally, but I hope not too often. Other things that we started to learn about very quickly after these changes was that there was no money available to develop any kind of services or supports, even though the tiger was still with us. By this, I particularly refer to transport. We were used to having separate transport and now no funding for same. We were expected to use the bus like everybody else, victory at last. However, we were still waiting on what we could deem to be a reasonably accessible bus, a reasonably accessible village, or a reasonably accessible county. Of course, if I knew then what I know now, and I had the benefit of mainstreaming, we would have insisted that people with a living experience of disability be strategically placed in all of the key departments and indeed local authorities. We didn't then know how valuable our lived experience was and how marketable it might have been. Um, that's, that's just uh, some of the things we started to put together and uh, that are kind of reflecting back on a message. But the most important thing I want to just really get back to is how many people here today are going to take the fight to the next level? Because otherwise, I'm happy enough to come back in 20 years time and deliver the same little chat and say we've heard it all before, right? But if we want to change things, only us, only us, and I'm just saying, let's borrow people's vote. And when the general election comes back, we will certainly know not just to use other people's votes, but our own votes as well, right? We had a minister this morning and he showed great understanding and great enthusiasm and so forth. But we know, we know that he's only a junior minister and he doesn't even get a say at cabinet and that it's all about Remember what the senior minister said last week? It's all about jobs. Uh, even jobs for the people that have left the country. He never mentioned any jobs for people with disabilities that weren't able to leave the country and, and so forth. So please, I urge you, get on your Facebooks, your Twitters and everything else. And please, please borrow people's vote and tell them how you'd like to see it vote. them vote for you. Thank you. Bye-bye.